you saw, we will read the next song. We'll be showing this. We're having a movie night on Friday, October 16th, if I'm right, uh, 7 o'clock. So looks like a really non-Kleenex kind of movie, so just <laughs> <laughs> so come join us. Um, also, there's a couple of announcements I want to start with uh, this morning. We have a couple of things going on um, in October that are starting up. Um, two things that I'm involved in. The first one is a Compassion, Mercy, and Justice Ladies Small Group that I will be uh, walking alongside. Um, anyone that's interested in joining me starting on Sunday, October 18th at 12.30 to 1.30 here at the church after the services. You can either have lunch before and come or just bring a sandwich and your own drink and we'll just meet here and kind of just walk through what does it mean to live out your life in this manner? What does it mean to live out compassionately, live out humbly, live out full of grace, uh, and, and um, walk into the mission field here in the community and around the world? So I just ask uh, ladies, if you're interested, um, come join me. And the other thing that I'll be facilitating in October is a marriage workshop. Now this is for everybody um, who would be interested in um, joining me this day and just um, spending the day together. It's called Together for Good, and it's a marriage workshop for couples that have been either are just engaged or have been married for however long here people are married. Seventy years? Eight, I don't know, a long time. So it just it's just a day to reflect. We're going through um, five different areas in a marriage communication and um, um, conflict, because there's no conflict in marriages, right? Like no relationship. So we're going to talk about that a little bit, spirituality and things like that. It's video based. Um, Cheryl and Neil Josephson um, produced it. They um, are directors of uh, Family Life, um, so they will be joining us on screen. and. Um, so so I'm only opening it up to 12 couples, just to keep it a little bit more quieter and simpler with the uh, COVID restrictions. So if you're interested, I have registrations here. Come and talk to me after the service. Um, there will be a lunch and snack provided. They'll ask you to bring your own coffee and cup and things like that. Uh, there'll be water bottles. So just uh, join us. Um, it'll be a great day. There's other things too. I think I'll to that. No, okay. Uh, maybe not. Yeah, that's up to you today. Um, <laughs> I'm just waiting to get here. It's a good day. God is good. All the time. Amen. So this morning, just our call to worship. I've been reflecting in Isaiah, and I just wanted to share with you from Isaiah 40. Um, just listen to the words. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. He does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. For youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly. Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Such powerful words. We will walk and not grow weary if we lean onto him to his strength, his power. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you this morning. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your strength. We thank you for your word. We thank you for who you are walking alongside us. We lean into your strength. We lean into your power. Help us to hear your word this morning. Thank you for your presence. And all God's people say, Amen. My name is Birungi. I am from a village in the rainforest of the Democratic Republic of Congo. God created this country full of potential. But after years of disease and rebel fighting, life is very hard for families. And it's especially hard for girls. My family has always been poor. When I was younger, I had to stay home on our farm to look after my little brother and sister. 
I wanted to care for them, but I really wanted to go to school. I knew if I could get to school, I might be able to help my family out of poverty, but it was too expensive. Then my uncle heard about a tier fund training program and savings groups. It would provide me with training and skills to help me climb out of poverty. When I heard about it, I was so happy. I joined and immediately felt empowered. They told me that Jesus values everyone and that we are all equal in his sight. They taught me how Christ offers freedom. I learned how to save. With newfound skills, I started a dressmaking business. I saved the extra money I made to buy a piglet. I sold the adult pig and had money to buy a calf. I'm now saving for more calves. When I sell my cows, I will be able to buy my own land. Without Tier Fund's help and the local church, I would be at home without even enough food to live on. I would be suffering, but I thank God for this work and how Tier Fund's support set me free. One of the verses I came to learn and love comes from Romans 8 verses 14 to 16. Those who are led by God's spirit are God's children. For the spirit that God has given you does not make you slaves and cause you to be afraid. Instead, the spirit makes you God's children, and by the spirit's power we cry out to God, Abba Father. God's spirit joins himself to our spirits to declare that we are God's children. Burungi's life has been changed through the local church and is grateful for the skills she learned to lift herself out of poverty and help her family's farm. She just recently got married and continues to grow her dressmaking business. She tastes freedom and knows that she is a child of God. But 87% of people in the Democratic Republic of Congo still live in extreme poverty. Together, we can change this. Your help is needed to provide people like Burungi the skills they need to lift themselves out of poverty. Please join us. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for allowing me to get up here to Lovely to see them videos, and they're showing the great stuff that's being done here for Canada. Here comes Canada. But you know, when I get up, can you hear me? When I get up, it's going to be a little different story. That you've got to be smiling and see what they do, and after after they've been here, what happens? But this is a little bit before that country, like your fine country. Tier Fund is a Christian-based organization, and they're working through the churches, supported by Canada and eight other nations, like the name of the nations we want to Well, actually, it's UK and Ireland, Belgium, France, Netherlands, Switzerland, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. A great bunch of nations in there. Most powerful organization in the world, as far as helping the poor. This year, the focus is on the Congo, which is ranked number one in the world's living in extreme poverty. COVID-19 now, this is all before, 19 is certainly adding to the huge problems. Closing the borders, all the stuff that they've been gaining and all this on their farming and all that, and what they weren't not, they could lose it now if they can't get stuff across their seed in for them and stuff that they've been going backwards. Closing borders and supply chains. They got no hospital, no no equipped hospitals, no government bailouts, no safety nets. Have a lot of fighting war in there and stuff, and militia gangs, and you know, there's a lot of a lot of women, with kids, and with this all hitting now, it's very bad. I mean, this here is beyond imagination, and. Uh, So this Thanksgiving, we got so much to be thankful for, even with the disease and stuff. We got, we got so much. <coughs> mm. 
actually the church is there. The church is there in, in the country to provide 55% of all social services because of corruption in the governments. Education, heart, uh, health care, and poverty of the other nation. That, that's a huge amount of churches are doing. And working and teaching leaders in the churches to go to the communities and, and to teach, that is a great thing. This is a great organization now that got this tier fund is awesome. But boy the problems now. They they really need to help with the church. It's, it's a big, big part of their being able to operate at all in these countries and saving a lot of lives. And like Jesus said, when you give a cup of water, some food, and invite a stranger in and give him clothes to wear, it is as if you were giving it to him. Well, this Thanksgiving season we are encountering many blessings. Please pray and see how we can show love to others in Jesus. You can donate through the church all the month of October. All things that come in from Michigan will be going to Tier Fund Canada through this month. It, it's a hard one to, you pretty near have to, I don't know. When I start looking at things like that, I looked up quite a bit, I just can't bring a lot of it up. But it, it's very hard, disheartening, you know. You think, you think every year it's going to get better, get better, and then something like this comes along and just knocks everything right down. And them countries are really feeling the want of it because they got no, not like us, the government bail us up and everything else. They haven't got that there. They got nothing. We just really see what we can do to help these people. Thank you. Thank you, Eli. Um, Lord, help us to know how we can help our brothers and sisters. Um, Pastor Jeff's been talking a lot about eternal life and death. And how those two go together, because God is full of contradictions and what well, we would perceive as contradictions. Um, so I was pretty struck by the, the woman, and she said, I don't remember the reference to the verse, but she did say something about knowing that she's a, uh, being children of God and being stout, grounded in that identity. And what helps us face the death that love, love is free, but yet it costs us everything. Um, the death that is demanded of us because God is cultivating in us something that is beautiful and he's restoring us to what who we really are. Um, so when she stands in that identity as she says that we are children of God, then we can we can stand firm in that when the we'll have moments of consolation in our life and we're gonna have moments where we're gonna have to die for ourselves and die for our will because we're constantly having to surrender more and more of us to the Lord because he wants to be perfectly one with us. And it is a journey because he's an artist and a story writer. Um, so this song is new, but we're going to we're going to sing the uh, chorus, which I didn't add the words in the beginning. But it's just the joy of the Lord is my strength, my strength. So we'll start, we'll sing it, and we'll have the verses. Um, but I ask you to please stand, uh, sing along where you can.
So those who know Yvonne, she passed away uh, recently. And she was one of those people who was kind of always here. We moved back here when I was 11. And she just seemed the same to me consistently. And then one day, she's gone. And it's like, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a reminder that remembering that this is not all there is and it's going to end, which is like awesome. And at the same time, it's like, oh, where am I in my walk with the Lord? And am I looking toward that direction? Um, and I know that he's patient with me and he's working in me. And he's creating this, uh, this peace that he desires to give us. So this song, we're going to sing in honor of her. We've done it once before, but it was when people weren't singing. But it is written, it's, the words are just changed. It's a familiar old hymn. Um, the lady who wrote it, she was praying at a gate, and she just said, she was just filled with inspiration. She could hear the war tune, but the pe but this words were one of peace.
together. It is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. And Sarah Jane, I don't know if you read my notes, but you gave a very condensed version. Of that. I'm going to give you the longer version. Of that. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. Uh, I've read it in a few different translations. I really liked how the New Living said this. Colossians 2, 6 and 7. Paul says, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, Strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. So as Sarah Jean mentioned, we have been talking quite a bit about eternal life. We've also been talking quite a bit about the subject of death. About dying to ourselves, dying to the old nature, to that old man. And it's not because we, we enjoy talking about death or, or somehow we look forward to it or enjoy even thinking about it. That's probably not who most of us are. It's because like Abraham... Like Jesus and like Paul, we believe in the God of life. The God who takes those things which are dead and raises them to life. The God who takes that which is laid upon the altar, what we lay upon the altar, that which is given over to death, He resurrects it back to life, eternal life. Life that is abundant and full. And so in response, Paul says, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him. Here it's okay, I'll just grab it. I saw you coming. Is Ron stand? Oh, that's okay. No, I'll just open it. I'll be like, you like. <laughs> Paul says in response then just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord continue to live your lives in Him rooted and built up in Him so if you've made a profession of faith in Christ and I, and I, picture, uh, I picture those who have gone to baptism They've gone to the waters of baptism. They stand before the, the group of people who are assembled there. And they make this profession of faith in the Lord. They say, I have chosen Jesus Christ as Lord over my life. I have chosen to walk with Him. Well, if you have received Christ as your Lord, if you've made that profession, then you have been called, at the time that you, you stood there before those people, you were being called to do something very extreme and very <coughs> radical. You were called to let your life die. Let this old life die. So as you entered into the waters, you experienced that. You allowed that old life to die in order that it might be raised back up in new life. <clears throat> Remember our verse from last week, Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. That's what we have to remember. It's no longer about me. I no longer live. I've now come under the lordship, the ownership, the authority, and the eternal life of Christ Jesus. Roger Wilmore says, when a person yields to the lordship of Christ, they acknowledge his ownership, and they give up their own personal rights. That's not something we do very easily, is it? Yielding to the Lordship of Jesus Christ also involves total, unreserved obedience. If He is the Lord of your life, all other things in life are to be let go of, cut off, 
surrendered, sacrificed to his desire and to his will. But one of the biggest problems we face is that our natural understanding of death, our natural understanding of sacrifice, our natural understanding of surrender, when we think about those words, what's the first things we begin to think about? We look at them as a negative. We look at those as an undesirable. I don't want that near my life. Death, sacrifice, surrender. So we picture death, as we said last week, we look at death as a final, as an ending. We look at sacrifice as a loss. And we look at surrender as a failure. But in God's economy, and here's what we as believers have to understand, in God's economy, in God's kingdom, they mean something completely different. Death actually means true and abundant life. That's something we're all seeking, is this abundant life. It comes through death. It's through death that we actually enter into life, the eternal life of Christ. We die to the old nature, the old nature that is already dying. It's decaying. We see that. We know that. It's corrupted. Just as Sarah Jane said, we, we have seen that in our own church family. This body is dying. That's a fact. But through that death, we receive a brand new life, one that is eternal, everlasting. The word sacrifice. In God's economy, it doesn't mean loss. In God's economy, it actually means abundance. Give and it will be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing will be poured into your lap. Sacrifice in the world's eyes means giving something up. But God says, you who are willing to sacrifice, I will give back to you in abundance. We think of the word surrender. To surrender in the world's eyes means capitulation. It means a failure. It means weakness. It means I've been defeated. But not in God's kingdom. In His kingdom, when you surrender your will to the will of the one who actually was the one who created you, you suddenly begin to find that you're walking in the purpose and in the plan of those who knew you, those, the one who knew you from the very foundation of the world and created you to do good works. So in order to live fully and in order to live abundantly in God's kingdom, we really do have to be those, those strange people, those peculiar people that we talked about last week from Hebrews 11. Those very strange people who have a completely different look on life and they, they see or they look at death as life. We look at sacrifice as gain. And we look at surrender as freedom. And when that begins to become the way we understand, the way, when that begins to become, uh, to take hold of our thoughts and, and, and our actions, when that's how we see the world around us and that's how we see life now, then we begin to find that we are now walking in eternal life. We're walking in this abundant life. And when that happens, something amazing begins to take place. We begin to send our roots down. Our roots begin to go deeper and deeper, actually into something that is fertile, something that is solid. Jesus reminds us, he says, anyone who hears these words of mine, anyone, and who puts them into practice, he's like a man who built his house on the rock. Because his house is now built on something that is solid. Where nothing can shake it, nothing can move it. The reason we still haven't gotten to the fruit, you might be wondering, will we ever actually get to the fruit? The reason we're not there yet is because, and I'm speaking <clears throat> about myself here, it's because I need so badly so badly to have my understanding, to have my mind and my heart grounded and rooted in the truth of God's Word, in the fullness of His Word. That 
That's where my thinking, that's where my, my, my thoughts, my actions have to be if I ever hope to begin producing the fruit of the Spirit in any form of abundance. Because we all know it isn't easy. It isn't easy for any one of us to embrace death. It's not easy for any one of us to be sacrificial, truly sacrificial. It isn't easy for any one of us to surrender. And so I need so badly to understand clearly the difference between this worldly kingdom and the kingdom of God. Because I don't want to be a tree that's constantly having to be pruned, to be cut away. I want to be a tree that's drinking deeply of the waters of life. Planted in a very fertile place, growing daily in strength and in health and in fruit. Fruit that others can feed on and others can be blessed by. But that takes, as we said a few weeks ago, that takes a complete renewing of the mind. It takes a, a new understanding of God's kingdom. Because you and I, we've lived, and we live for now, in this kingdom. This kingdom of the world, that's where we function, that's where we work, that's where we, we move and have our being, the kingdom of this world. And we've been educated, and we're certainly being educated all the time, more and more, in the kingdom of this world. Through school, through TV, through social media, through the things that we see all around us, the things that we strive for in this life, all of that is teaching us how do we live and function in this kingdom, and we easily, very easily, because we're birthed into it, we become adjusted to thinking and living and reacting in this kingdom. But God's kingdom, and this is so important for us to understand, for me to understand, God's kingdom actually stands in direct opposition to the kingdom of this world. You see, the worldly kingdom, when we live in the worldly kingdom, we naturally fear death. We flee from death. And we consider death final, the last, the last chapter, the closing chapter, the end of the book. But in God's kingdom, death is the doorway that we enter through that leads us into life, eternal life. The worldly kingdom sees sacrifice. When you sacrifice, it's seen as a loss. It's, it's forfeiting something that I deserve to have. And our desire of this worldly kingdom is to gain more rather than to give more. It's how we act. It's how we function. It's how we were raised. But God's kingdom says it's better to give than to receive. The world's kingdom says that to surrender, well, you've been defeated. You're a failure. You've given up. My rights matter. My rights are very important. But in God's kingdom, he says to surrender is to be exalted. The last will be first. <coughs> Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. You see, we were raised in the kingdom of the world, but God's kingdom, it takes faith. God's kingdom takes a renewing of the mind. God's kingdom takes becoming this brand new creation with the Spirit of God within us in order for us to understand and live now fully into it in order for you and I to produce fruit. Fruit that will last. Not just fruit that's here temporarily that just falls and disappears, but fruit that's going to last, last onto eternal life. It takes a brand new way of thinking. It takes a brand new way of doing. It takes a brand new way of living. It takes being rooted in Christ. What does it mean for us to be rooted in Christ? How does that look? Because we were once rooted in this world. We were rooted in this worldly kingdom. And we lived and moved and we acted within the structure, structure and within the pattern of this kingdom. And that's where your identity, my identity, that's where I found it. Rooted in this kingdom. Rooted in this system. <clears throat> 
Don't you love the analogies God gives to us? So easy, really, for us to understand. It's so deep that we'll never exhaust it, but so easy for us to understand. Trees and branches, fruit and roots, pretty easy, really. We all under know what it takes to, to see a, a plant grow up or to see a tree grow. We know what it takes to, to find where's the best soil, where's the sunlight going to shine most. We plant that seed, we care for that seed, we water it, we nurture it. God's actually made it quite easy for us to understand it. And, and so what does it really mean to be rooted in Christ Jesus? Well, we go back to what Sarah Jane was saying. To be rooted in Christ means death to us. Death to that old root system that was feeding on the things of this world. That root system has to go. It has to die. Why? Because I've been crucified. I entered into the waters of baptism. I was crucified with Christ. I no longer live. But Christ now lives within me. So what has happened is I've got a brand new life living in me. This brand new life starts to take form. It's not a bad thing, it's a glorious thing. My roots now begin to feed and begin to draw now from a different life, from a different source. Not from the source of this world, not from the source of my own desires and wants, but they begin to draw from a new life, the eternal life of Christ. And so things have to change. Things begin to change. First, my identity changes. Because I no longer live. I don't live any longer. Christ now lives within me. So my identity has to change. So the things that I once fed, that once fed my life, the things I was nourished by, they no longer do. So I have to begin to see myself differently. And so I now see myself through the eyes of Christ, through the lens of Christ. Listen to what God says of those who are in Christ Jesus. Are you ready? This is our new identity when we are rooted in Christ. He says we are adopted into God's family. We have been justified by His grace, purchased, purified, washed, cleansed, forgiven, and sanctified by His blood. We have been rescued out of the kingdom of darkness and we've been brought into the kingdom of light. We've been bought at a price. We've been made alive with Christ. That's the eternal life of Christ. You and I have been made alive in that. We have been raised with Christ. We're actually seated with Christ. We've been predestined, chosen, sealed by the Holy Spirit. Saved unto eternal life, reconciled unto God, and called to be a witness of all that God has done for us. That's our new identity. That's who we are in Christ. And something else begins to happen as well. When we become rooted in Christ, when our roots start going down deep, we begin to hunger. We begin to thirst for something different. Not the things of the world anymore. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. If we were to be honest, I think the whole world actually is hungering and thirsting for this. They just seek it in all the wrong places. And their hunger and their thirst actually can't be quenched. Not without a renewing of the mind. Not without being born again, born from above. Not without being rooted in Christ. So instead, as I once did, we turn to all kinds of other things to fill that void, to try and quench that thirst. But Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Proverbs 12, 28 says that the wages of sin is death. Yes, it's true. The sin in my life will cause me to die. But guess what? I did die. I died to it. I've been crucified with Christ. I said a few months ago or so to, the, to whoever it was that was getting baptized, the water was so choppy and rough, I said, you know what, that's the only death you need to fear. That's it. It's the only death. Yeah, you leave this body behind. God's got a brand new body for you. That's okay. But that's the death you need to fear because you're now raised up into life. 
Life that can't be taken from you. It's eternal. Proverbs 12, 28, the wages of sin is death, but in the path of righteousness is life. So we die to that death. We die to that old nature. We're raised up in the righteousness of life. And in that pathway, when you begin walking in that eternal life, there is no longer death. It's gone. It's removed. How often we think of the word righteousness when we think of it, we think of something that's unattainable. We think it's some kind of a behavioral modification. So in order for me to really be righteous, well, I have to, I have to be so much better. I have to try and attain some kind of new standard, some kind of impossible level that I can never make. That's not what it is. God says, seek after it. What are we seeking? We're actually seeking after Christ himself. He is righteousness. And so if we are to seek it, it's got to be attainable, it's got to be achievable, it's got to be there to be found. And it is, and it's found being rooted in Christ. Because it's no longer about me. It's no longer about you. It's not about us attempting to make all these modifications on our own. Instead, it's, it's all about just allowing Christ to fully live within us. Not because I'm going to lose. Not because I'm going to lose by allowing Him to take over my life. Because, because I'm now going to gain His life within me. And that hunger and that thirst finally are quenched. Quenched by the righteousness of Christ. Yet Jesus told that woman at the well, that woman who was so full of shame, who figured she had missed the mark of righteousness forever, I'll never be, I'll never make it. He said, yeah, you're right. Because whoever drinks from this water, this worldly water, the water of this kingdom, they'll thirst again. They'll always be thirsting. They'll never be quenched. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him, they will never thirst. For the water that I shall give them will become in them a fountain of water, springing up into this everlasting life. And that's what it is that we all hunger for. The everlasting life, the things of eternal life, the things of God's kingdom. Where we believe that in dying, I'm now actually truly living. That in sacrifice, I am gaining. And that in surrendering, I am raised up and exalted. That's what being rooted in Christ means. I become a brand new creation. And I no longer live, but Christ who is eternal life. He is the eternal life. He lives within me. And so I have a brand new identity. Praise God, I am no longer a slave to sin and to death, but I have been born again. I've been adopted into the family of God. I've been set free. I walk away from sin and death because I've been made alive in Christ. And I no longer hunger. I no longer thirst after the things of this world. Now I hunger and I thirst after eternal life. And eternal life is Jesus. And so my hunger is for Him and for His life to be revealed and reflected in me. That's what being rooted in Christ means. And from there what happens is a new tree begins to grow. And finally, you know what happens? That tree begins to produce fruit. Fruit of the Spirit. Paul says that if we are rooted and built up in Christ, then our faith will be strengthened. The King James says we are then established in the faith. I like that. We're established in it. We're rock solid in it. We're standing on it. Nothing can move us. We trust God's word now over our lives. We yield our lives to Christ. And we base our lives on his word. He is the logos. He is the word. That's what we base our faith on. Not on those around us. Not on books we might read. Not on what the media might say. But on what God's word says. That's who we are rooted in. Christ. Paul says, when we are rooted there, that will cause us to overflow with thanksgiving. Because we see over and over, every day, as we awake, every night, as we go to bed, we know who we are in Christ Jesus. And we say, thank you, Lord. Because my foundation is unshakable. 
Now I look at the kingdom of the world. I look out at the kingdom of the world and I see it from a completely different view, a completely different perception. Because we are now living, rooted, and grounded in the kingdom of God. And I'm believing that in death, oh, there is life. True life. That in sacrifice, there is abundance. And that in surrender, there is freedom. So we become a brand new person, living a brand new life in a brand new kingdom. One rooted in Christ Jesus, walking in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we give you praise this morning. Our hearts are full of thanksgiving, overwhelming with thankfulness for all that you have done for us. When we were yet enemies, you died for us. You gave to us this freedom. You gave to us this gift of God, which is eternal life. And then you sought after us. You pursued us with a love that is everlasting. You caught up to us and you said, you haven't missed the mark. I am the mark. I will be your righteousness. Root yourselves in me and you shall walk in abundance. You shall produce the fruit of the Spirit. Lord, I pray that for each of us that we will root ourselves in you, that we will seek after you, that we will believe, that we will believe that in death there is life, in sacrifice, great gain, and in surrender we do find freedom. Lord, help us just look above the worldly kingdom that is so prevalent around us that, that calls our attention, draws our attention, seeks our attention. Help us to look beyond it to the kingdom of God, to the kingdom of eternal life, to the kingdom you've called us, appointed us, chosen us. And may we produce fruit that will last unto eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray. When you receive this word of blessing, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's people.